I'm sure we all have questions about climate change. Even those who work in this field, like me and our guest today, especially when it comes to individual action, we wonder, are my efforts helping fight climate change? Is my organization supporting this? Is my city and, and my country you know, together in this? Are they in line with the efforts to bring down pollution, plastic waste, and all other things that are affecting the natural world and in turn ourselves? What are the answers to some of those questions? Be prepared to see a glimpse to uh, some of those questions today. Hello and welcome. This is Sustainability, the New Normal, presented by EvalueServe, and I'm your host, Vamsi Krishna. Over the past 20 years, EvalueServe has worked with and supported leading organizations across the world in their journey towards sustainability. In my introductory episode zero, I mentioned our agenda broadly. With all the content on sustainability out there, I feel that there's a perspective that is missing, which is talking about this as the new normal. And of course, that's what we named the show after. In our first episode today, I am joined by an expert I've worked with over several projects in sustainability across the wider circular economy domain, which I'll talk about shortly. We have Tariq Arora here from EvalueServe, who is currently the Associate Director of the Energy and Decarbonization Practice. Welcome, Tariq. Welcome to the show. Could you please uh, introduce yourself and share a few details about your experience and working across sustainability? Thank you, Vamsi. As you rightly said, so I currently work as an Associate Director with the Sustainability and Decarbonization team at EvalueServe. I bring in about close to 13 years of experience. Majority of that has been in domains that we'll be focusing on today. And I think at EvalueServe, we work with industries across the value chain to help them with their overall sustainability agenda. And I think one key theme that we're seeing over the past few years is centered around circular economy, which I think we'll be talking a lot about today. Uh, circular economy has been a key pivot for us, uh, the organizations that we work with, uh, because I think over a period of time, a lot of organizations have realized that, let's say, materials transition can help them meet their you know, net zero agenda. And I think that's what we exactly do here. At EvalueServe, we help these organizations understand how to best apply different principles to bring, you know, to unlock value that's there in the business. So I think we can, we'll continue the conversation around this. Absolutely, thank you very much. That was quite crisp. So thank you for joining in, Tariq. So coming back to the questions that I posed uh, earlier, and even with what's going on around the world, right? Tariq, in fact, I often wondered about, you know, answers to some of those questions, like, for example, the, you know, let's say the UN related organizations, you know, they have been going on about climate change, right? The human centric causes that are happening, the dire need to act, right? And fixing uh, a responsibility on the right stakeholder and finally taking action, right? And, and I believe that the UN related agencies have been releasing several reports annually and they talk about a lot of things, right? For example, coming to emissions, you know, there are, let's say the, there are three broad categories where emissions, right? The carbon dioxide emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions generally come out of uh, energy, transport, and industry. Uh, and I think these reports also mention about the level or, you know, the magnitude, the complexity of the problem, how big it is, right? And in fact, they are related like a spider's web, uh, something in one industry, in one sector connected to some other industry or sector and how the repercussions are felt across different uh, sectors, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sure you would agree with this. And in fact, in fact, in academics, climate change is, is kind of called as the wicked problem because uh, when, you, when you're looking at a problem, right, when you want to solve a problem, you need to, let's say, you need to decide. You assign who, is the, who exactly is this problem for, who can solve the problem, what are the boundary conditions, you know, what are the limitations in which you operate, and what are the resources required, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to climate change, there's everyone being affected and in a sense, everyone is also responsible. So how do you motivate everyone to act, right? Now, that might be too broad a question, right? In some cases, we see that there are people who are definitely motivated to fix things, people, uh, people organizations, uh, nations, uh, but sometimes they may end up falling in a trap and able to help themselves. So sleeping on these questions, Tarek, over time, and thankfully to the projects that we worked on, did help me understand to an extent, you know, that we've definitely come a long way, right? See, I'm going to admit something here. What I'm going to ask you today, in a sense, about sustainable practices around the world, it's not something that's happening for the first time, right? They had been going on for a while, and 
a lot of companies have been doing these, let's say, planet fixing activities. However, I think that it's only now or in the recent years, in fact, that these sustainable practices are actually cementing into strong business models, right? And are getting more profitable. And, and in fact, this is expected that it would take time, you know, when something is new and not challenging, you know, to the incumbent regime or, or the norms that exist today. So no one would have a problem. So these take these do take time to you know come into the mainstream and become a reality. So Tariq, any thoughts on what I've shared so far? You know, which of uh, those questions related to climate change, uh, you know, even material resourcefulness that you mentioned about, right? That that you connect with the most. What do you what do you think? I think as you rightly said, a lot of these conversations date back a lot, right? And I think these conversations came into mainstream discussions when the Paris Agreement was drafted, I think sometime back in 2015. I think that's right, where the real conversation started, right? People like you and me started talking about these things and the businesses started taking things a lot more seriously. But I think the initial few years were definitely a bit slow. You know, people, will, organizations and businesses were still trying to understand, like, what does this agreement mean, right? What are the various elements that are involved? And what actions do I need to take as a business or as an organization so that I am positively contributing to that? And I think the initial few years kind of went into that. I think majority of the change that we saw came during the period, let's say, between 2020 and 2022. I think when you know COVID-19 struck all exactly. of us, that's where a lot of realization happened across the value chain, across people across organizations and we started taking things a little more seriously i think that's where the real conversations begin and i think as an organization also as evaluserve we also realize the same right the action that we have seen in the last four years i right. think you know that is more than what we have seen in the last 10 years put together right so these four years have been really heavy on how organizations want to tackle this agenda right from circular economy, you know, one of my favorite subjects, but also to other areas, right? Uh, renewable, renewable energy, you want to talk about hydrogen, you want to talk about biofuels, you want to talk about carbon offsets, again, you know, being seen as a big go-to lever to solve this problem to an extent. So I think, but yeah, as I, as I said, all these conversations begin at a point in time, they were slow initially, but in the last three to four years, we have seen a lot of action, a lot of commitment coming in from businesses and organizations, right? And when I say commitment, those are like on-ground investments being made. Exactly. It's not just about, you know, for let's say PR or for publicity that organizations are talking about these problem statements and how are they tackling them, but it's also about uh, the real investments flowing in, real money flowing in. In fact, it's not just about money, right? If I take let's say a very smaller example from let's say a consumer goods firm like you know so those organizations are not just putting in money they are also actively participating across the value chain to bring that real impact so i think i would just reiterate that last three to four years uh, we have seen a lot of action and i think this is only setting the tone for the next five to seven years at least till 2030 we see this you know only accelerating from here bang on actually. So I think 2030 seemed to be a kind of a magic year because we see a lot of companies and even countries, you know, who are publishing their targets for 2030. You know, it kind of seems to be like this benchmark here. Okay. I think, which as you said, rightly said that, you know, during COVID and post COVID era, I think this has gone up. So where I think they have started setting up targets in 2020, 2021 and have up to a 10 year target, 10 year timeline, right? Up to 2030. So I think that's a good observation. And yes, in fact, post COVID, I, in fact, I even remember reading that a lot of ESG funds have seen growth spurts, you know, a lot of money flowing into that. So definitely that's, that's a right observation. So given all this experience, Tarek, so I got ready with some very interesting questions for a discussion today. And, and I want to talk about one of the key elements which is at the intersection of linear and circular economy, which is waste or the waste resource. In fact, it is becoming more and more obvious that many large corporations and countries are you know, going forward with their carbon neutral plan. Surprisingly, some of those strategies don't seem to include you know, circular or, or, or you know, they're not circular enough. Uh, I mean, see, managing waste right, is surely a massive challenge right, across, across several parts of the world, if not most parts. And municipal solid waste, you know, or mixed waste, uh, right, which is sometimes through segregated waste collection, 
and or plastic flowing into rivers or oceans, whatnot. I mean, if you remember the 80,000 tons of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, right, which is floating across the Pacific Ocean from one side, you know, from the Americas to the Asias, right? So, yeah, I think any any thoughts on that? So, I think, Mamsi, those are very relevant and very valid points because waste is something that has been a big problem, right? And waste can be through multiple waste streams. But I think one specifically you mentioned was uh, municipal solid waste or household waste, as we kind of alternatively call it, right? The problem right. begins at, at a place where it gets generated because collection itself is broken, right? So we are not collecting enough unless it gets collected we will not never be able to recycle it but again that depends a lot on the market that we are talking about that depends a lot on the kind of waste stream that we are talking about but end of the day collection is a big issue apart from collection waste litter environmental leakage are some of the challenges that now we are seeing you know uh, being openly talked about Environmental leakage can mean different things for different people, right? Someone openly burning waste is environmental leakage. That waste finding its way into water bodies is environmental leakage. And right. I think that is also something that you briefly touched upon. We are seeing a lot of plastics and microplastics in our oceans, right? So, and I think that has initiated a lot of conversations even at the consumer end. Because, right. you know, when you talk about plastics, when you talk about packaging, you are di directly being influenced by what the consumer thinks, what the consumer believes. So waste has been an issue, but as an alternate thought, waste can also be a resource, right? Not, not only the waste that has been generated so far, that can definitely be put to a better use, but also going forward, what kind of waste we want to produce, right? and how it contributes to a circular economy are you know some of the questions that we are looking deeply into along with the organizations and businesses that we are working with so waste definitely has been an issue it is getting highlighted as we move you know from here on but there are solutions available there are best practices available there are regulations being framed right which will help which are helping organizations pivot to a more circular economy. So we are seeing a lot of action in this space. And I think we can talk about that a little more in detail. Right. In fact, so what you said is that, yes, right now it presents, it, you know, it represents a great opportunity for us to fix what's broken, right? With the system, you know, clean up our oceans, reduce plastic usage, improve maybe the use of alternate materials, if not plastic, and improve our waste collection and even recycling streams, right? And, and to grow sustainably which is what uh, several companies are already doing. And I believe we are supporting some of them. And this is all tied up to the, you know, growing body of work, which is associated with, let's call it the, the, the circular economy that, you know, we've been referring to, right? So to start with, right, I think Ellen MacArthur Foundation defines circular economy as a way in which products uh, and materials are kept in circulation, you know, through processes, right? Like maintenance or reuse or refurbishment or recycling. And there is never waste or things being thrown away. So this is very interesting for me because whenever I hear stuff that there's no waste, it's of course, it's ideal, it's utopian. But I think the idea of circular economy is that it does not, it, it calls waste as a design flaw. It does not want to generate waste and it needs to, you know, go back circular. So it needs to break the linear economy and then join back. It shouldn't just be take resources, make stuff, throw it away. So it shouldn't be, uh, linear, but it needs to go back into the loop. I think that's where circular economy comes in. How do you see this reflect uh, in your experience? See, I think, first of all, I definitely completely align with that definition of circular economy, the way Ellen MacArthur defines it, or let's say some of the other prominent organizations or bodies also define it, so completely align with that. But I think, interestingly, if you try and follow how circular economy is being defined, even that definition has evolved over the last few years, right? Initially, if I remember correctly, like four or five years back, when we talked about circular economy, majority of the focus, you know, majority of the focus was on, let's say, either reducing waste or recycling. That's where the definition squarely focused on. But in the last few years, that definition has definitely evolved. So we are going beyond reducing waste. We are going beyond recycling. In fact, uh, we are taking a systemic approach. So that's how we internally define it, right? Viewing it right. as a complete system 
right from any product that is being conceptualized till its end of life. That's a whole system that we need to take into account. And the definition has also started reflecting that, right? You want to right. design products that are truly circular. You want to manufacture them in a way that is more efficient and effective. You want to create an ecosystem around those materials that helps keep those materials in a loop rather than you know letting them go linear. So, and also, you know, apart from these, we are also definitely looking at how different waste streams, how we can derive value from these waste streams, right? Waste for someone could actually be a raw material for someone else. I think that's that's the broader definition that is shaping up now. And that is being reflected in the way conversations are happening. That is being reflected in the way organizations are taking various initiatives to tackle this problem. Exactly. In fact, in fact, yes, waste for someone is definitely a raw material for someone else. So with this backdrop, right, of waste landscape, where do you see the waste resources or, you know, the waste that we generate, which are the resources, right? So where do you see these waste resources in the big picture, right, as commercially feasible raw material, right, for, for industries? I think before going into that, we also need to realize that you know how big the problem is we first need to understand you know what is the problem that we are looking at so i think of countries like the us of a let's say one of the biggest uh, countries or let's say china or for, for that matter any other country we produce hundreds of million tons of waste on an annual basis and i think this is just the municipal solid waste or household waste that i'm referring to right there right, are multiple right. other streams. We are producing commercial waste. We are producing industrial waste. We are producing agriculture waste. We are producing construction and demolition waste. So there are multiple waste streams. And end of the day, it's it's like you know billions of tons of waste that we are talking about, and on an annual basis, right? So there are opportunities that lie within each and every waste stream, right? Not every waste can be utilized, let's say, industrially or in a fashion that you know we can make it truly circular but there are streams there are opportunities that exist within each and every stream that we kind of need to understand a little more in detail before we actually kind of comment on this and i think again really you know kind of relaying to one of the points that i previously touched upon the key here is to ensure collection be it any type of waste that we are talking about the key is to ensure collection segregation and when i say segregation again it could mean different things for different waste streams right for something like a municipal solid waste or household waste source segregation is the key right but whereas right. for certain other streams source segregation might not be a big showstopper so you can have the right infrastructure in place to do that for you but collection is something that we need to ensure segregation is something that we need to ensure and one of the most important elements that we have seen in the last few years is end use markets, right? You have a lot of waste that can potentially go into, you know, something more useful, but you also need to identify which are those end use markets, what those end use markets need, what are they ready to pay? Because once you have demand coming in from those end use industries, right, then you will see all the value chain getting active and feeding into that demand. So it, it's definitely a chicken and egg situation that we have seen. But end of the day, I think the good part here is both chicken and egg are reacting to this situation. Okay, so when, okay, that, that, that's, that's a nice way to put it. So when you say uh, collection and segregation, right? So maybe if I can say segregated collection, which means I put my wet waste or my food or organic waste separately, I put my plastic waste separately, I put my paper waste separately and so on, right? And then this waste which is segregated already is handed over to the waste collection agencies in that segregated manner, which can then help in, in taking things forward. So, so th that's what you mean. Both yes and a no. Definitely at the consumer or the customer end, this is what defines as collection, right? But let's say when you are collecting waste in a multi-bin system, a lot of countries have implemented these multi-bin systems, depending on the type of waste that we are referring to. But when a waste management firm 
that collects that waste from your doorstep or let's say from an industrial park or from a commercial setup, right? How do they take it from there to the next step in the value chain? be it a sorting facility, be it a waste transfer station. I think that also contributes a lot. Maybe you are collecting in, let's say, say you're kind of segregating it at the source itself. But what if it right. is getting mixed as we move ahead in the value chain? So the definition right. of collection has also widened a bit across the value chain. And we again, you know, as I previously mentioned, it's a systemic view that we need to take if we need to you know, create a positive impact here. In fact, several times I've reflected, you know, while we worked on some of these projects that the term waste, you know, has started to gain an entirely different meaning altogether. You know, perhaps, you know, as we were discussing that we shouldn't use it to mean that something use of no use anymore, right? Because that's not the case because it still has some use. So there is useful part of the waste, you know, that can be segregated as per a raw material requirement, right? For certain industries, it could be dry, it could be wet, or, or you know, it could be the remaining unrecyclable mix. And I believe that all of them find you somehow and help in closing the loop. I want to discuss this a little deeper, right? About how waste plays as a key role for large corporations. So especially, you know, some of the major oil and gas companies, you know, who are kind of playing really big in this place. So what do you think of that? Like, do you have any examples that come to your mind that you can talk about? Definitely. So I think we might have hundreds of examples floating around, but one of the most interesting or most fascinating example that I personally look at is we definitely know that let's say some of the energy majors or some of the energy companies they are looking at let's say use cooking oil UPO as we call it as an input source as an input feedstock to produce a sustainable aviation fuel or even biodiesel right so that you mean jet fuel the fuel that goes into airplanes exactly the fuel that yeah, goes okay. into airplanes that we fly into right so used cooking oil, a cooking oil that has seen its end of life, that has seen its life, you know, after it gets discarded, if properly collected, if properly managed, it can actually, so there is technology available to convert that into jet fuel, right? But wow. as an energy company, how do you actually deal with that? You have the technology know-how, you can develop that technology, you can demonstrate that technology, you can make it work. but there is a larger piece of puzzle that you need to solve. And that is where organizations currently are struggling a bit, right? Because this is something that is not core to their business. They do not know where is this use cooking oil getting generated? How do I best collect it, right? In the required quantity, in the required quality. Both these aspects are very important, right? Quantity, right. simply because you want your processes to be more efficient. Quality, simply because as soon as the quality deteriorates, you know, it starts stops making commercial sense because then you need to put in additional operations in place to make that work for your technology. So exactly. Uh, so this cooking oil, it can come from our homes. It can come from restaurants. It can come from anywhere. Right. So like hundreds absolutely. of locations where used cooking oil can be sourced. So that would. Yes. Yeah, so that would definitely be a big problem for them on how to get that used cooking oil. Right. So absolutely right. So in fact, as you rightly said, right, cooking oil gets generated at our homes within the Horeca segment across industries and so on. And it's really difficult for these organizations to understand how the overall value chain for that looks like, right? Where do they play across that value chain so that they are able to access that, you know, use cooking oil or that feedstock in the required quantity and quality. And I think this is where uh, EvaluServe as an organization has definitely been helping some of these organizations because they do not understand this value chain at the moment. So, you know, mapping that complete value chain, trying to understand what are the sources that I need to tap into, right? Obviously, an oil and gas company would not be going doorstep to doorstep collecting used cooking oil from each and every household, right? It will definitely not make commercial sense, right? So there right. has to be, again, a systemic approach put in place there has to be a better understanding of the value chain and you need to understand like where do I play in that value chain and how do I play? Do I play directly? Do I establish partnerships that help me play? So those are the kind of questions that, you know, these organizations have and, you know, we look into those questions a lot more deeply. Right. 
so from waste we are able to so so from the household waste i generate it's possible that i'm able to fuel an airplane right i mean i mean i even read that you know it's possible and we even worked on projects right where waste to energy for electricity heat right as well as fuels for transport as you mentioned right so that's a lot of applications and the remainder part of the waste let's say the part of wet waste which could which let's say goes into our bins right uh, in the waste generation process it goes through something called anaerobic digestion where the waste is broken down in the absence of limited oxygen and it produces digestate something which can be used as a manure for crops right uh, so but what's interesting here is depend the specific type of agricultural waste as well right you have companies which which you know uh, produce several types of biofuels right because now we to- talked about used cooking oil which is from homes and restaurants but even agricultural farms you know farms they generate agricultural waste and residues and biofuels can be produced from there right and i believe this is what is growing quite a bit particularly i mean across the world and even in europe or in the uk we see that there are new public support incentives subsidy schemes that are coming up to actually support this and i think that is what is helping the oil majors sometimes justify you know their long term prices and billion dollar uh, acquisitions in deals as well right that is absolutely right and in fact all these points are also a factor of market that you are talking about right there are market level nuances there is no silver spoon there is no silver bullet or there is no one solution that is applicable across the value chain or across different markets for example incineration that you touched upon right mm-hmm. in a geography in a market where we are seeing a lot of litter or environmental leakage there incineration as a solution makes perfect sense right because you have bigger problems to deal with but in markets where you know waste is already being routed towards incinerators or it is being properly landfilled i think those markets have a different problem to deal with they want to move up the value chain they want to look at how do i divert this waste from incinerators from landfills to something more useful how do i actually recycle it how do i upcycle it or downcycle it make useful products out of it because again you know we have seen that europe as a region has also has always been incinerator heavy whereas let's say if we talk about countries in the americas region they are more landfill heavy landfill heavy. because right we do have a lot of space available there and you know there is there is space to kind of create new landfills and so on whereas europe the space is at a premium so again the solutions depend on the type of market that you are looking into and there will obviously be market level nuances including regulations that you also briefly touched upon right because right. if you're playing in any market you have to ensure that any recycling or end of life that you are ensuring for the waste has to be in alignment with how that market particularly de- defines the end of life or recycling so i think your points are absolutely valid it's just that there are country market level and country level nuances that definitely come into the picture when we look at all this absolutely so in fact depending on where i live you know in which part of the world i live uh, you can say that waste to energy is like giving your garbage a second chance right it's like you're allowing it to turn into something more useful in a form of electricity you know that can power your tv you know which where you can binge watch on netflix so in, in a sense i kind of like to think that uh, your trash is powering your entertainment but yeah coming back to uh, agricultural waste right so in fact these agricultural waste as well in some of the uh, geographies in europe as we are discussing they help to you know produce chemicals or fuels right like methanol ethanol or other transport fuels and today we actually have many countries that have mandates to mandatorily blend petrol or gasoline with ethanol right so to produce uh, low emission transport fuels so even wet wastes from municipal waste or household waste can make this happen right so i think it's a really beautiful way to you know close the loop where you know crops are grown from the soil and crop waste eventually returns to the soil as a manure you know in in a sense so and and i believe there are several technological pathways you know that are available to you know convert those wastes into usable forms of energy and we've worked on some of them with some of our clients so yeah in a, in a, in a sense the kitchen waste from our homes is probably going to one of those trucks that's shipping items to your kitchen right and maybe that truck is also using biofuels so yeah i think that here is right where we see that the i'd like to bring in the net zero element 
that we discussed at much beginning of the of the discussion today so do you see the municipal waste as a net zero or as a net positive or a net negative resource you know because it could definitely be a raw material right that can help big companies bring down on their emissions you know provide economic benefits right and and there is all there also available in plenty right so there are enough reasons so how do you see the interest of these companies changing you know like like if you can give me example of for example you mentioned consumer goods earlier so maybe i'd like to understand how this waste is being looked at right by consumer goods companies and i believe that this also has a very strong uh, element of you know connection where where they are definitely trying to compete to appear more sustainable and not only appear but actually take action to be more sustainable right to meet their goals see i think the overall consumer goods industry is a very interesting case in itself right till a few years back so see when it comes to consumer goods i think we are directly referring to let's say packaging waste because that's the biggest right. waste contribution that is coming from this industry right? right so if we look at a few years back right the focus was squarely on how do i design packaging that is technically more recyclable right so there are fewer challenges in recycling it whatever the end product is you know there are end markets available for that and so on and that's where the buck stopped but right now even these consumer goods companies these brand owners they are focusing on something called as actual recyclability right the right. packaging should packaging should not only be technically recyclable it should actually get recycled so there is a big difference between these two aspects so first of all we have seen that shift happening right that's the that's the first angle the second angle is i think the the consumer goods industry is actually facing multiple issues one is definitely the waste that they are putting into the market because that is across materials across formats let's say and you know across uh, yeah primarily across materials and across formats and each material and each format has its own issues you know that come with it that's so when that's we say first. material and format we means you know there could be bottles there could be bags cups tetra packs you know tubes and they could again be in plastic they could be in paper they could be in glass you know cans aluminum cans tins and so on right so cardboard boxes so across those different kinds of packaging formats and materials absolutely right so i think you have already talked about a lot of materials and formats so those are the precisely the materials and formats that i was referring to so they have a lot of problems to deal with right second is a lot of these consumer goods companies in fact majority of them they have taken circular economy as a big pillar as a big pivot to their net zero agenda right and this is where they have defined very specific targets definitely they want to reduce the usage of virgin materials be it virgin plastic virgin metal virgin glass be it any material they want to reduce the use of that material in its virgin form second is how do i substitute that right so you want to substitute that with something called as recycled content if exactly. you are creating a can of a beer right that is made up of aluminium it potentially can have certain percentage of aluminium virgin aluminium and the remaining percentage of let's say recycled aluminium coming coming in right right so now how do you get access to that recycled content that you can put in there you know put in your fresh packaging so they are not just dealing with the waste that they are putting into the market they also need to worry about a lot of other factors and recycled content being one of them and all this is tied up to their um, overall objectives that they have defined within their circular economy pillars so that's the first thing second is i think regulations also are playing a very big role here right epr the extended right. producer responsibility it actually puts a lot of pressure on the producers and majority of them are being are let's say brand owners companies like right. procter and gamble unilever pepsi coca cola right they are under that tremendous their responsibility does not end by just selling but they also need to bring back that waste back into the production floor to produce their uh, packaging materials right? exactly so they are now responsible for waste that they are putting into the market they need to ensure that you know that waste gets collected they need to ensure that it gets recycled in any form right so that is an added pressure on them that is an added not just a cost pressure 
but also an understanding pressure, right? Because when the waste gets into the hands of the consumer, when the product gets into the hands of the consumer, this is where these organizations start to lose track of those products. They, they technically do not need to keep a track of those products, but now they need to. They need to understand if I am drinking a can of beer, right? What am I doing with that can? Where is it ending up? How can that be collected? How can that be recycled? How can that be put back into the value chain? So that's a lot of things to worry about. So I think exactly. these are some of the you know areas that they are looking into. And to be very true, I find this very fascinating that you know how these organizations, how these brand owners have really come up the curve. They are participating actively across the value chain, right? They are investing across the value chain. They are ensuring their direct participation in activities like waste collection, waste segregation, waste recycling. And, you know, it's kind of heartening to see that. Absolutely. So actually, that's a very good point that you touched upon, right? After I use this beverage can or a bottle, right? And I throw it away. What happens to it? If I use, uh, if I have a packet of chips and I throw it away, what happens to it? If I throw away a pouch of detergent, right? What happens to it? What is the journey that it goes through once it is done from my end or our end? We throw it in the trash. And after that, what happens to it? So definitely that's a valid point that yes, so organizations would like to understand, not only understand, but really be invested in that to actually solve the problem of how, how they can integrate it back into their uh, production facilities, how it can be recycled back and how they can even minimize that waste. Absolutely. So I feel that this is where the trying to close the loop, right? I think the, the regulations on EPR, I think are also definitely pushing these uh, organizations to close the loop effectively. Definitely. And in fact, talking about consumer goods and packaging waste, Tarek, how frequently do you order stuff online? You know, maybe on, on Amazon or instant groceries. How frequently do you order that? Every other day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in fact, you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, what's bigger, you know, if it's my carbon footprint or packaging from my online shopping. Right. Sometimes seeing so much packaging waste, right, sometimes is like a guilty pleasure. But although I do try to, you know, make sure to reuse that and recycle in every way possible. Sometimes when we are done using a product and there is a box left or a jar left or something left, right? I somehow I just kept keep staring at it. Like you're so beautiful. I can put you to some good use. Right. And I keep thinking about it and I just neatly accumulate them all by the side. And my wife asks me, why are so many used boxes, cans, jars doing that? Right. I think there is definitely an element where even at household level, right, people definitely want to reuse, you know, some of them or try to recycle them instead of throwing away. So, yeah, I mean, the different kinds of packaging as we discussed, right, like bottles, pouches, bags, sashes and all. I think, yes, companies are definitely looking for for, you know, some kind of alternate uh, materials, right? If not plastic, what? Uh, maybe it could be pick paper, right? But then how could I make paper? So they do have a lot of these questions, right? Which not only ties up with their sustainability goals, which not only ties up with reducing plastic, but also their bigger goals, uh, I believe, for sustainability and eventually reducing, uh, you know, reducing their emissions down. So in fact, their efforts, yes, are definitely not just one time here. I believe that they are, you know, building supply chains and investing in the value chain of these products or of this waste so that they can contribute further right into the uh, into the, the the circular economy part so when you're talking about bottles i think it's not just plastic that we're talking about maybe it is also about glass that we are talking about right because in kitchen items as well we have honey ketchup uh, pickles right sometimes which are stored in glass jars and glass bottles not just plastic bottles so Glass is perfectly recyclable, isn't it? I, I believe it can be recycled multiple number of times. Uh, although it gets recycled back into glass, unlike other kinds of waste, which also become energy. So what, what is the scene there? How is the glass recycling space going on? That's I'm sure that's another huge market, isn't it? I think before going into that, one point that, that I definitely want to highlight is moving to different materials, right? Mm -hmm. Alternate materials is something that is, let's say, on top of the list for a lot of these organizations, for a lot of these brand owners, because we understand that plastics are a bigger part of the problem, right? Plastics are a big problem, let me put it that way. And when we look at alternates to plastic, this is where definitely there are different issues associated with each and every material. But I think there are benefits as well, moving to, let's say, these alternate materials. So 
Alternate materials is an area that a lot of organizations are exploring. Beyond that, I think another good point that you talked about was reusability or let's say even refillability, right? Those are some of the business models that a lot of these brand owners are looking into because even if you make your packaging truly circular, even if it gets recycled, there will be energy spent in recycling that, right? It will have its own carbon footprint. It might exactly. be lesser than or more than, let's say, uh, as compared to virgin material. Producing a new packet. Exactly. But it will still have its own footprint. So reusability and refillability. I think these are some of the latest interest areas that we are seeing from a lot of brand owners. And they really want to understand how can they let's say implement reusable packaging because that's a very different business model that you need to look into you know there are the, the value chain is entirely different you need to worry about different factors as compared to you know let's say putting your products in a single use packaging so reusability refillability are some of the important angles then i think the second point that you touched upon was let's say glass bottles absolutely right glass is technically infinitely re recyclable right you can produce glass by recycling glass and i think that is also true for some of the other materials like one of my favorite example is like uh, is around used beverage cans or ubcs as we call them right aluminium cans now right. that's a very good example of how that material itself is supporting recycling right because of the inherent value of that material the entire value chain gets you know kind of activated right use beverage cans they get collected i think in some of the markets the collection rates are crazy high they are like 99 percent, right and 99 percent is something that you really cannot do anything beyond that right almost everything is getting collected simply because that material itself has that inherent value that material itself has the capability to incentivize the complete value chain so 99 percent getting collected and then it is rooted towards recycling now, when I say recycling, it can definitely root back into, let's say, fresh cans, or it can find its application across other industries as well. For example, automotive industry is a big consumer of recycled aluminium coming in from used beverage cans, right? Right. So, right. ensuring collection, ensuring segregation, ensuring recycling, and then there is an end market already existing. That's why, you know, it's one of my favorite examples that I take. Uh, UBCs are a perfect example of how the overall value chain can work together to ensure recycling and, you know, then gets incentivized along the way. Wow, that's that, that that's actually amazing to hear. But, you know, within one product, right, sometimes it's not just one material. For example, when you, you, you earlier mentioned about a beer, beer bottle or a beer can. So if you take a beer bottle, it's a glass but then there is a metal cap to it, a closure to it, right? And even when we take a pet bottle of a soft drink, the entire body is made of one material, but then the closure is probably made of a different material. So sometimes, you know, uh, we can even ask, why do companies use so many materials? You know, sometimes in a single product's packaging, right? But, you know, one can argue that a great packaging doesn't just protect a product, but it elevates it, right? It's, it's the product's red carpet. So not just materials, I believe a lot of thinking and planning definitely goes into it. So we, we talked about how these big companies are, you know, involved in turning waste resources into competitive end users, right? Now, how about, I mean, like even consumer preferences, I believe are definitely driving and shaping that, right? Especially on social media as well. You know, different segments of consumers are, uh, are definitely pushing forward for this change that they do not want to see a lot of trash being thrown around and they definitely want to see some action that is being taken from the side of the organization so i think even consumer preferences are definitely shaping the way companies uh, produce packaging material and even sell their products now my question is who is paying for all this right because it's definitely not going to be cheap so company may have to invest additional resources in trying to procure all this waste materials back so who is paying for all this like I believe in most cases, it is likely the customer who is, you know, bearing all that, isn't it? Yes, true to an extent. In fact, we have seen multiple studies where we realize that the consumer is definitely willing to pay a premium, you know, for sustainable packaging because, you know, that's where they get that feeling that they are, you know, contributing to a cause. So definitely the final bill definitely rests, rests on the shoulders of the consumers. 
but i think it's also important to understand let's say you know the packaging that is earlier going into waste right some amount of money is being spent for management of that waste be it collection be it incineration be it landfill right someone needs needs to pay that gate fee someone needs to pay that incineration tax that is applicable across certain geographies so the money was already being spent across the value chain now that money needs to be spent differently that is one thing so that is one thing that we need to understand the second is simply because you are also utilizing those materials giving them a second life that's where again you know you are getting a positive impact from that cost as well right so that's another angle to look at so definitely right now we are seeing you know a lot of premium across these let's say packaging types and the consumer is bearing that premium but going forward if the value chain works in a structured manner a lot of those costs would be easily managed would be easily absorbed across the value chain itself and then i think it will also be a factor of you know let's say what if this does not gets done right regulatory pressure again as i was initially talking about right under epr if you do not follow the obligations of epr as a brand owner you are liable for penalties right so yes that's right that is also money being spent so whether you want to spend it there or whether you want to invest that kind of money across the value chain to to kind of you know obey or to kind of oblige those epr uh, mandates now that's a decision that you know these organizations definitely need to take actually hearing this right now it's bringing me back uh, to the point of what is kind of let's say causing this problem of a lot of waste being generated and one of the factors is, that you were uh, also highlighting is about segregated waste being collected right uh, and in fact i believe that of course several waste collection agencies maybe in some countries it is the city municipalities that they do it but it could also be several private companies that are doing that job so i believe that a lot of waste management companies right or waste collection companies therefore have an increasing role to play here and it's not just collecting that waste from households uh, and even commercial establishments but also possibly segregating if they are not segregated right and then even transporting them to the place where all this activity needs to be done in fact a city's waste infrastructure i think you know it also ends up playing a key role right and its waste management authority or waste management stakeholder ends up becoming a very important stakeholder therefore so how do you see this space evolving with uh, several waste management companies uh, you know playing a key role here and how are they getting this kind of job done and which other companies you think they are supporting see i think definitely waste management companies or municipalities they have a big role to play because i think they are directly interacting with that waste and their participation ensures that the waste is rooted to the right a uh, facility to to the right step in the value chain so that it you know obtains a circular route rather than being a uh, linear i think again there are couple of factors here one is a lot of these bigger waste management organizations they have also taken pledges they have also taken their targets around you know how do they want to contribute to the overall bigger problem and that's where take they are taking a lot of initiatives also let's say again taking an example from the consumer goods industry right a lot of these consumer goods industries are also investing a lot of money across the value chain including in collection maybe through these waste management companies itself right to incentivize right. them to collect the right materials let's say a multi layer flexible packaging no one in the entire value chain would have interest in collect- collecting that material right because there is no inherent value in that there is no end market for that at least there is very limited end market for that so right, someone there is plastic, needs like there's aluminum there is paper in that and what not multiple materials in that yes absolutely right so someone needs to incentivize for such materials and that incentivization is definitely coming from a lot of brand owners combined together with the fact that even these waste management organizations have taken their own targets and also there is a lot of regulatory and consumer pressure to deliver this in the right fashion i think that's how the overall value chain is kind of coming together we are seeing a lot of partnerships happening we are seeing companies leveraging each other's expertise to kind of deliver the right outcome to deliver the right message so this transition right toward 
the new normal in sustainability right now as i understand is spread across all the industries right that we have discussed so far energy transport fuels consumer goods right i mean it's it's a far wider phenomena I, i'm sure it's not just limited to these industries so this makes me think you know there should be some common factors that is causing such a pan industrial you know effect impact rather on a massive scale right how people perceive about the subject is playing a key role here isn't it like their preferences to a consumer brands right and even packaging is as we discussed before greatly pushing companies towards uh, cleaner alternatives and also with social media as a large canvas right both consumers as well as producers right they are getting to design build and even shape the narratives towards a more uh, you know sustainable choices that uh, are required right so how do you see this across let's say other non consumer facing products and services you know that we discussed earlier right what are the other factors that are affecting you know in those non consumer facing uh, roles so i think when we talk about this problem as a whole i will definitely not put the consumer angle out of the equation because definitely consumers are driving a lot of this change right so we as consumers we need more sustainable options we are ready to pay a premium but beyond that i think what is truly driving a lot of these initiatives is regulations which i briefly touched upon previously as well right, right. we took an example of how extended producer responsibility is playing a big role now another example potentially from the same industry could be around drs deposit return scheme right so which focuses on certain types of materials not just ensuring collection but also ensuring that those collected materials are sent towards recycling and there they get recycled right so a lot of these regulations are actually putting pressure across the value chain they are making the organizations uh, react to this situation but how do actually organizations react to that situation where do they want to play across the value chain i think that's an open statement that that's an that's a open piece of puzzle that you know businesses are trying to solve in collaboration with let's say companies like evaluser that we are part of right so again right. i would say that based on my understanding regulations is the biggest push that we are seeing but how do you want to implement it there are multiple options you want to evaluate those options you want to ensure that, that whatever option that i'm going ahead with as a business that creates the maximum impact at the minimum possible cost right that that's the equation that you know various organizations are trying to solve it's actually a perfect way to put across how different factors are impacting and in fact in fact that is also draw helping us draw to a conclusion for this episode today tarik i think you've summarized those factors very well so maybe if i can let's say go over through the main points you know the the major points that we discussed right from how waste economy is a is a key part of a circular economy in a sense right one one point is that your waste isn't just a useless thing anymore you know it 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 can provide electricity it can provide you know power uh, power your vehicles provide heat or even provide uh, nutrients or manure to crops right so it is also a raw material for other products and this has already become new normal for you know a decade already across several markets maybe north america in europe or even in asia pacific right and the resourcefulness of if i can if i'm able to capture the points that you mentioned clearly the resourcefulness of waste lies in how easily the waste item can be integrated back into our you know everyday lives and mainstream economy right therefore preventing waste in the first place right that could probably be the utmost priority right maybe a piece of paper does not have to be thrown in the bin uh, or you know in the first place right it can be continue to be used or reused therefore prevention is an important you know aspect then followed by reuse and then maybe then comes recycling right and if none of them are feasible then maybe we can look at disposal but i believe you know circular economy does not happily look at disposal as one of the you know methods of waste management right so how would you let's say conclude you know about waste management then as a part of circular economy how how do you see them both you know uh, coexisting there so i think again one of my most favorite top topics one of my four favorite things to talk about end of the day again i'll be repeating one of the point that i previously mentioned it's about taking that systemic approach right right from conceptualization of the product of the service 
to its end of life you as an organization you need to have that complete view then only you will be able to you know identify where the leakage hotspots are across the value chain how can i kind of plug those gaps right, right. and what does it need to plug those gaps is it an investment is it a partnership like how do i play across that value chain so when you're taking a systemic approach you are ensuring that the product and service that you're designing or conceptualizing is truly circular we are also creating an ecosystem in parallel that can keep that material in a loop and then you're also ensuring that you know whatever material that you're either keeping in the loop or that let's say somehow exits the loop because of let's say various inherent issues how do you kind of put that how do you tap into that waste stream to derive value out of it so again you know that systemic approach is very much necessary and i think that's the crux of this conversation absolutely absolutely systemic approach is the way forward to go thank you very much uh, tarik for all your inputs today for the discussion i mean this is an definitely an amazing discussion that i've had on circular economy and and the waste economy thank you very much for sharing your uh, uh, time with us and to those of you joining us online please feel free to share your comments your responses to what we discussed is there something that you agree that you disagree something which is happening differently in your country in your region where you see maybe something that you would like to share with us about the waste practices that you follow or maybe if you are a startup or an organization please uh, drop your comments below and please do join uh, in the in the discussion and i'll try to reply as soon as i can and once again thank you very much tarik for joining us today and sharing us uh, your time and your valuable uh, points uh well thank you again i'm see bye